At this stage, very little. The government of Kiribati is indicating that it will probably put out a statement at some point fairly soon. Uh, I imagine that the, the Chinese authorities will also put out some sort of information via state media at some point. But for now, there's no real record of exactly what happened at the meeting. Now, there's actually been quite a bit of controversy about this leg of Wang Yi's visit because Kiribati, of course, is under a very strict COVID lockdown in the sense that its borders are essentially closed. Uh, they had a terrible spike of COVID cases earlier in the year. They've now brought that under control, but they're very anxious about people coming in. And the word from Kiribati by journalists on the ground there uh, is that the government of Kiribati was actually not that enthusiastic about China uh, coming over and Wang Yi stopping off because of the, uh, the double standard that it seemed to present. Uh, and they say that the fact that China in the end got this stop off with extraordinary health contingencies put in place, everyone being masked, half the contingent from China staying on the plane, a team of doctors being flown in uh, to essentially provide advice and then to stay in Kiribati to help with the situation. Uh, all the people in Kiribati in the meeting going into isolation for a week afterwards. I mean, really, you know, extraordinary health measures being taken here. Um, the fact that that happened and, and, and the fact that the meeting still went ahead, they say, speaks to the fact that China basically heaped pressure on Kiribati to, to make this happen. Now, this has been put to the Kiribati government. They haven't responded, so there's no official word yet as to whether... Uh, they, uh, they agree with that account, but that's certainly the word from Kiribati, despite the overwhelming closeness of the two governments over the last couple of years since Kiribati recognised China and, and ditched Taiwan, it does seem like some real tensions flared up here. Now, there's also been a lot of speculation about whether Kiribati might sign a security pact with, uh, with China, perhaps one similar to the... Uh, to the uh, the, the agreement that was signed between China and Solomon Islands. Now, we don't yet have any official word as to whether that's happened or not, but one source official uh, from Kiribati has been qu quoted in Reuters uh, saying that there was no discussion of security and that all of the, the talks focused purely on economic issues rather than anything else. Um, now, we haven't yet got any way to verify that. I've asked people in the government. They haven't got back to me yet. Uh, but it does sound like it's possible that there wasn't a huge focus on security and the early word out seems to be that no such security agreement was signed. Meanwhile, our new Foreign Minister Penny Wong has been meeting with Fijian Prime Minister Frank Bainimarama today. What's happened there? Yeah, that's right. Penny Wong has uh, spent about 36 hours or so in Suva. She met with Frank Barney Marama as well as other senior ministers, including the Attorney General and the Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum, uh, Henry Puna. By all accounts, the, the trip has been a success. It's not just Penny Wong's people saying that. Others in, in Fiji have also really heaped praise on the new Prime Minister. Now, there is quite a lot of continuity between this new government specific policy and the policy of the previous government. They've been very quick to take pot shots at uh, Scott Morrison, but the reality is a lot of the Pacific step up, so called, which Labour is continuing, uh, was really the, the brainchild of the former government. But there are still, nonetheless, some points of difference between Labour and the coalition, and there are two points of difference in particular which Labour thinks play in their favour and will result in even stronger relations between the Pacific and, uh, and Australia. The first of those, climate change. Obviously, Fiji, along with other Pacific Island nations, has been really critical of Australia's climate change policies. They were fiercely critical of Scott Morrison's approach to climate change and argued that the coalition simply wasn't doing enough to, to cut emissions. Uh, now, on that front, Labor has got a more ambitious policy, uh, a promise to, to ramp up ambition to cut emissions more steeply by 2030. It does not go as far as Pacific Island nations would like, but nonetheless, Penny Wong can plausibly claim that there's a scale-up in, in ambition there, uh, and, uh, and she can argue that that's going to bolster Australia's diplomatic stocks in the region. The other thing, labour mobility. Now, the coalition did quite a lot of good work on labour mobility, but what Labor's done is it's proposed a new visa stream, uh, about 3,000 or exactly 3,000 people a year permanently coming to Australia through, through a separate visa uh, stream, which is going to be established by the new government. And that's quite distinct from the, the labour mobility schemes that we've been talking about. And once again, Labor says that this is a nod towards the importance of the Pacific and that that's going to help bolster Australia's stocks, not just here in Fiji, but around the whole region.
And Stephen, what's next for Penny Wong and also China's foreign minister over the next few days? Well, uh, Penny Wong has now left Fiji, is returning to Australia. Wong Yi, however, is going to continue on this really extraordinary marathon sprint through the Pacific. Uh, next stop is uh, Samoa uh, before coming uh, to, uh, to Fiji, where he's going to hold this meeting uh, on Monday with a, a host of foreign ministers uh, from, from the Pacific, largely virtually, uh, before jumping on to several other countries, including Tonga, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea and Timor-Leste. So the scale and scope of this trip really is extraordinary and it does seem to be a very deliberate, for, a very deliberate signal here from China, perhaps particularly in the wake of the Quad meeting in Tokyo with Australia, India, Japan and the United States, that China is intent on intensifying its strategic, commercial and potentially security links with the region. Uh, I think Australian officials will be watching this very, very closely. Uh, there is... Uh, there have been, uh, there's been a lot of speculation about what deals might be signed. Of course, we know that China has got this sort of broad framework agreement which it wants up to 10 Pacific Island countries to sign uh, when it meets with, uh, or when Wang Yi meets with, uh, with foreign ministers on Monday. Now, that agreement, if it were to be implemented, would potentially have really significant consequences. The agreement's really vague, but it does seem to open the, the door to a whole range of cooperation across a whole range of sectors, ranging from cyber security to policing uh, to uh, trade uh, and also to things like pandemic management. So Australian and, and Western officials will be watching that very, very closely. Stephen, thank you.